education is, has enabled and lower cost tools has enabled more people to enter into this business. So I think to be competitive in the face of AI, in the face of business skills or, or whatever, it is going to require you, all of us to look at what is the value proposition that we're actually offering our clients. Welcome to the Music Business Facts Podcast, where successful music industry experts share their industry secrets that will help you take your music career to the next level. G'day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Music Business Facts. My name is Rodney Holder, and this is my podcast where I interview successful music business practitioners and entrepreneurs and experts about how to try and carve out a successful career in this crazy music industry. Now, a while back, I was searching the web for some great new music business resources, and I came across a really cool Facebook group that I thought you guys should hear about and you should go and check out, particularly if your focus is on being a composer and you're trying to make money as a composer. So uh, a couple of guys, uh, Chris Boardman, Sebastian Wolf, and uh, Xiao An um, run a Facebook group called Business Skills for Composers. Now, Business Skills for Composers, like I said, is a Facebook group. And funnily enough, it's for composers. And the, and the main discussions are solely around you know the business-related practices. So um, go and check them out, guys. Uh, do I'll put the, uh, the link to the uh, group in my show notes. But if you do, a uh, obviously, a search in Facebook for Business Skills for Composers, you can go over there and join the group. Very, very cool stuff going on. And like I said, I just thought it would be great to uh, have a discussion with these guys. Again, one of the things I love about you know running a podcast is that you get to uh, reach out to strangers and uh, introduce yourself. And uh, yeah, these guys are, like I said, are doing some really cool things over there. So um, they've got about 5,000 members and growing rapidly. So you know, there's a really good little community over there. And again, just I, I encourage you to go and check it out if you think that might be... Uh, of interest for you. This was also a really interesting podcast for me because it was my first uh, three-way interview. So I'm trying to interview three people at once. So yeah, it was very interesting. Um, like I said, Sebastian um, Wolf is uh, he's from Seattle and he's sort of a bit of an expert on licensing and royalties. Uh, Chris Boardman is a university lecturer over at the University of Miami and has got a lot of experience working with some amazing uh, singer, songwriters, and composers. And Xiao An, uh, An is uh, he, he's really really great as well. He's do, he does some great live presentations over there. Um, during the conversation, we had a, a really, you know, sort of broad uh, discussion on things like songwriting and royalties and music for film and TV and games and commissions and copyright and intellectual property, um, particularly with a United States focus, which I think is very interesting as well because we do things a little bit differently here in Australia. Uh, we talk about music licensing and performance rights organizations and business skills, uh, opportunity for composers, uh, things like creating audio brands, which I thought was really interesting, and even get a little bit into uh, um, artificial intelligence and uh, computers writing music, which is also really cool. So yeah, I thought it was a great conversation. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, I hope you get something out of it. And uh, yeah, without further ado, here's my conversation with Sebastian Wolf, Chris Broadman, sorry, Boardman, and CRN from Business Skills for Composers. I really hope you enjoy it. Before we start, I, I like to ask my guests just to tell them, uh, my listeners a little bit about themselves. So uh, let's start with you, C. Alan. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself personally, and then uh, we'll go through the other guys quickly? Sure. Okay. I started out in music uh, wanting to be a studio musician. I played on a bunch of albums, and I toured with the Singapore Armed Forces before going to Berklee College of Music, where I decided to become a composer. And uh, I very rapidly realized that uh, one of the most lacking things in music education is how to use that to make a living for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so after I graduated, I fumbled about and tried to learn everything on my own. And I started a company called East Coast Scoring, which uh, does orchestral recordings and productions with uh, Boston-based musical contractors. And uh, at the moment, uh, my company is Lee and Ortega, a company that I have with David, and we write music for games, uh, advertisements, and anything else that requires music for a commercial purpose. Excellent. And uh, just quickly while I got you, just with Berkeley, was it uh, a good experience studying at Berkeley? Would you recommend it to people to do it formally? I would absolutely recommend it to anyone for whom the cost would not be crippling mm -hmm. um, because it, I did learn a great deal from it. I made uh, great deal connections. It was my entryway into the United States as I'm originally from Singapore. 
Mm-hmm. But I would say that if you didn't go to Berkeley, you should not expect yourself to have any less success. Uh, you just have to learn <laughs> the same things. You just have to learn the same things on your own. Sure, you know? sure. And, and there's a lot of material out there. It's possible. Excellent, excellent. All right, Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian Wolf, do you want, you're in Seattle. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Um, I'm also not originally from the United States. I grew up in Germany, and I've been living in the Bay Area for most of my life, actually. I uh, grew up as a classically trained musician um, who found his way into video game music in high school. And through that, I tried exploring uh, you know, transcribing, arranging, ultimately orchestration. And that's how I got my first foothold in uh, the professional music industry. I started taking commissions and ultimately ended up going to school for film and music. Um, I started a music licensing company uh, out of college um, called Acapella Records. Uh, we ultimately rebranded and called ourselves Louder. We did mechanical licensing clearance, um, which is essentially spreadsheets and legal and accounting for days. It's very glamorous. Uh, but through that, we tried effectuating some positive change and updating some of the technological aspects of the music industry. Um, I'm the founder of Materia Collective. Uh, we're one of the largest music publishing and distribution companies for video game music. And we really like bridging the gaps between the creators and the fans of the music world. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Well, we get, uh, Sebastian. And, uh, uh, that's good. <laughs> I'm going to have to get uh, all of you guys to send me all of your credentials and links because you guys are doing so much. I, I do have Chris Boardman. Chris, I didn't get where you were based, sir. Where about you? Well, I, I'm, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, but I currently live in Nashville and teach at the University of Miami. So wow. I commute to Miami every week, and that's, that's a, a bit of a grind that's going to end here soon. But my background is I, as a professional musician, hell-bent on being a composer, arranger, orchestrator. I started my professional career in 1974. You're uh, a veteran. For, yeah, or old, one of the two. <laughs> but, yeah. I've, but I've been at it a long time. I've, I've worked on uh, uh, a lot of movies, like more than 100 films, uh, countless TV shows, I've won a lot of awards through the years, I've worked with people like Quincy Jones and David Foster in the record business and Steven Spielberg and wow. Bruce Broughton and James Newton Howard, Michael Kamen. So I'm kind of like the old, uh, I'm the, what, the Yoda <laughs> of the group? <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's great, Chris. I mean, that the, uh, that the wisdom and the experience—that's brilliant. So, uh, uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Let's let's talk about because uh, it was the it was the name of your Facebook group that really reeled me in. You know, business skills for composers, and here I am, a, a business teacher in Australia, a business coach, and I'm running a music business podcast. So, again, welcome to the show. Can you tell us maybe when you talk to you might just want to quickly say who's talking, so my guests, uh, I'm my listeners know who it is, but. Can you tell us a bit about um, the business skills for composers of the group? I mean, can anybody join? Um, what's it all about? What do you guys do over there? Who is it meant to serve? Uh, who would like to take on that? May I? Please. Okay. So um, business skills for composers was created uh, in mid-2016 because there weren't other Facebook groups that dealt solely with the concept of business development strategies and skills and related uh, technicalities within music, mm-hmm. right? And we, we wanted to have a place for people to discuss just those things without all the self-promotion and the marketing. And um, it's one of the things that is sorely lacking in most music education programs uh, in colleges is the ability to take that music that you've learned, like the the ability to create that music and also translate it into a business that you can sustain and earn money from, right? Cover your costs and and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, the group is a a kind of a great platform for mass dissemination of this knowledge. And um, there are a lot of people in the group that because they're very engaged and many of them are veterans, just like Chris, and they have a great deal of wisdom to share, sometimes they chime in with uh, interesting uh, bits about the business they've done over the years, you know, tips for younger composers. Younger composers can feel free to ask questions uh, like, uh, for example, how do I get a gig? 
And uh, it's one of one. This this question is very commonly asked, but and usually the answers are very unsatisfactory. Mm-hmm. But but people begin to learn, you know, for example, how you how you start to get prospects, right? How you go, to, which conferences to go to, depending on what field you're in. For example, if you're a video game composer, you go to conferences like GDC. You would meet people there, and uh, you develop relationships. Uh, that eventually may turn into prospects that eventually may turn into leads that eventually turn into contracts that pay you. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a very basic thing of business that most salespeople know, but most musicians don't. Yeah. So that's just one of, that's just one of the skills. And, you know, for example, Sebastian uh, knows a great deal about music licensing. So having an expert like him at the group, uh, means that anytime someone has a question about licensing, right, um, he's usually there. Mm-hmm. And he's usually there with very accurate information. Uh, Sebastian, you want to talk a little about that? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think it's fantastic that the proliferation and dissemination of useful information has become more of a focus, especially in the next generation. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's the sort of group and uh, resource that I wish had been around when I was growing up and I, you know, was thinking of, you know, is the music career for me? What opportunities are there? And of course, as time changes, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to sort of keep up with, okay, how do I get that knowledge, especially for someone who might not necessarily want to go the college route, might be more independent or independently focused in terms of knowledge acquisition. So having the group is fantastic. Um, I suppose I should uh, add the disclaimer that uh, I'm I'm not an attorney, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> just out of legal reasons. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit too close to uh, my passion for copyright law, so uh, nice to get that out of the way. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, so I, I've worked in music licensing for about 10 years. I've read far too many contracts and agreements and stumbled across far too many minefields of <laughs> contractual... Um, um, opportunists, shall we say, mm-hmm. where part of it wants part part of me definitely wants to pass on that um, caution in a way to musicians who might be very excited and willing to sign an, you know any kind of agreement that provides them with an opportunity, but all of a sudden they have sold all of their rights for a dollar, or all of a sudden they are obliged to do things for the next fifteen years that they never wanted to or never signed up to do. Mm. So. Um, my focus and my goal for my contributions on business skills for composers is to help out with some of the more technical gray area copyright related aspects and hopefully guide people not only with an, with an answer, but also an intuition to seek out knowledge and experts um, as they are operating in the field. That's awesome, Sebastian. And Chris, did you want to add anything to that, sir? Yeah, you know, I come at this. Can you hear me? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, I come at this from a, a little bit different perspective. In in the sense that that I've had to learn how to become a business person after being primarily a musician. Yeah, you know, I was trained as a musician, and the um, how should I say this? When you when you're a musician and you're young and you're ambitious and and you've got a story to tell and you want to scream it out to the world, you know that's what's important. And musicians spend an enormous amount of time by themselves in a practice room or in a studio or or wherever they happen to be. And it's very easy for these particular types of people to lose uh, contact with basic people skills mm. the ability to connect with someone else which is which is you know a uh, commonplace in business if you're selling a product you're going to want to have a conversation with with the person that you're trying to sell or conversely wanting to buy uh, buy from right mm-hmm. yeah and and there's this there's this big gap that exists because it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of hard work to become an excellent musician. Mm-hmm. It's a consuming profession. So this whole notion of business and business development is something that that is for a vast majority of musicians is foreign to them. 
I agree. And they live in a, they live in a little bubble, and they know how to operate in that bubble. But get them outside of the bubble, and and they're staring at their shoelaces all day, and they can't carry on a conversation. Sure. So, um, I try to bridge that gap with my comments, and I've kind of adopted this role as a teacher, teacher mentor type person mm-hmm. to those specific individuals who may be the most talented people you can possibly imagine, but have no idea how to relate to anyone else outside of their little bubble. Yeah, so yeah. So that's, kind of, that's kind of my focus, is to, to, to uh, uh, help, help them understand that, that any sort of media business is a collaborative venture. Mm-hmm. That means that you have to know how to listen, you have to know how to be uh, specific and concise in what you're trying to say, and you have to be able to package and position yourself in a way that is attractive to people who are going to buy your service. Yeah, fantastic. And, I, and I, in my experience, I find that two musicians, like you said, they're, they're so passionate about their songwriting, they're so passionate about their performing skills and, and learning their craft that they do neglect the fact that this is this, this does need to be a business if you want to monetize it and make it do it for a living. And Quite yeah. often, in my experience, these right and uh, brain-sided people, you know, they, they struggle with that with those business skills because it's boring. You know, if you're doing stuff like uh, Sebastian was talking about copyright law or taxation or whatever else skills you need to know. Yeah, it's uh, it's not as exciting as uh, as writing, is it? Yes. So, so in, in, I view my role in this situation as being one of the, I've been through what you've you're struggling with mm. and this is what i this is what i how i navigated my way through that now yeah. the other guys can make their own comments about the veracity of that approach <laughs> or the can, if that's actually accurate but that's what i attempt to do anyway cool cool uh Sian, did you want to say something sir uh well uh chris is certainly right and this is is definitely one of the most glaring um holes in the development of a musician as a person right and Mm -hmm. in in a way in a way this group also kind of serves to uh, provide a safe space for people to practice these skills yeah because there there are because there are a lot of these discussions about (laughs) topics that can sometimes be very heated like whether you should work for free or not Mm -hmm. Uh, it is an opportunity to practice disagreement because you are going to disagree with your clients at some point and um, you want them to still want to hire you and still like you at the end. And uh, what Chris was saying about positioning and, you know, uh, you know, to be seen as an authority and to be, to be able to be convincing, that's also something people practice in the group. And um, certainly another thing that musicians very, uh, at least the ones that I know, uh, seem to lack is the ability to think of themselves as having power in a negotiation Mm. especially composers because they're gonna they they'll do anything because they they really love music and they want to have it as a career but they don't realize they they're unable to to observe from the outside their importance in the situation and thus their negotiating power so you know in that's that's also something important that's discussed in the group that i think people learn from it awesome that's great um, so for my listeners, guys, if you go onto Facebook and you just type in business skills for composers, uh, you'll see that uh, there's, what, 4,378 members as of today. Uh, can anyone join, guys? How do you vet people? What, what do you, you know, is there any, you know, you just, you just send a request? Is it as easy as that? There are three questions that they have to answer. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when, you, when you apply to join, um, there are three questions. Mostly it's... Um, it asks whether you have read the group rules, mm-hmm. whether you plan to abide by them, and whether you are uh, a, comp- a working composer or hope to be one in the future. Um, even if you are not a composer and you are in the music field, uh, you usually we let we let those people in as well because it's still it's still the music field and uh, they'll have something to learn as long as people don't advertise themselves everyone can join sure sure and yeah. I, for me the word composer there's that connotation that maybe i need to be you know fluent in writing music and i'm you know maybe got a classical background if i'm if i'm a, a heavy metal guitarist that's writing songs do you see that am I, am I a composer is that is this the right group for me of course you are absolutely yeah fantastic because as I told you guys before we started, a lot of my group, uh, a lot of my listeners, they come from a rock or a metal or a, a, a pop background. So, um, yeah, that's great to know. So let, me, 
Let me let me just speak to this for 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 a second because this is something I focus on in my teaching. Mm-hmm. Is that musicians are just a different form of storyteller, mm-hmm. and it, and I try to be agnostic in my classes about types of music because you know I I, I had no idea wh- uh, EDM even existed or dubstep when <laughs> I started teaching about six years ago so what it, it's popular music is is it is a part of coming of age and every generation has their own focus in terms of what's meaning to meaningful to them what speaks to them so the Sure, you can be a classically trained musician and go to school and get degrees and all the rest of that. But if you know how to tell a story, how a story is structured, you can apply your musicality to any f- kind of medium, media and be successful at it because your job as a composer is to support the story that's being told. Mm. So, so I would not, I would not uh, hesitate to get involved if you have an interest in, in writing music for media, regardless of what your personal taste is in music. Mm. You know, you're going to bring something unique to the table that's unique to you that if it's appropriate for the story, it could be very cool. I mean, look at uh, uh, the social network. You know, Trent Reznor (laughs) wins an Academy Award. Mm. Is he a classically trained musician? I don't think so. (laughs) Sure. So so there you go. That's that's really valuable for people to, to be aware of. Not to say that curiosity and training is not valuable. Yeah. That's a completely different issue. Yeah, absolutely. But stylistic music or pedigrees or validation and, and is not necessarily necessary. No, that's great. I just wanted to clear the air for my listeners that you know you didn't have to have a violin in your hand and uh, sheet music and that to, to join your group because it is a really great resource. You guys have let me in and I've gone through your your threads and looked at some of the stuff you're talking about. So. Uh, for my listeners, for anyone listening to this, it's really a no-brainer if you want to learn more about the music industry, especially from you guys with a more American-based, um, I guess, scenario. I wanted to ask you, with, with all of those members, are they from all around the world? Are they majority U.S.? or We have members from everywhere. Yeah. Uh, we have members in Australia. We have members in Singapore, members from China, from Japan, from Sweden, Cool. From Finland, yep. from Iceland, uh, just off the top of my head, I'm sure there are more. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the thing is, the laws will change in different territories. Exactly. But concepts, but that's that's the that's, a, that's a that's a language issue for the most part. In details, the concepts are pretty similar. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's bring you in, Sebastian, because I wanted to to bring that up here in Australia, for instance. We have a a seemingly much superior, and I don't want to say this and sound egotistical, but in Australia we seem to have a much more superior copyright registration system in the sense that you just have to put it into material form and you have automatic copyright. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about how that differs in America? Oh, certainly. Um, And, of course, again, (laughs) the disclaimer of not an attorney and all that. (laughs) Um, So the, the way copyright law here in the United States is phrased is that you have the copyright the moment something is fixed in tangible form. So you write sheet music, you know, pen and paper, you know, you create a Reaper file, you record yourself screaming into your iPhone. You have something that is fixed in tangible form that has a date stamp, that has something. Mm-hmm. Now, the the onus is, of course, on you as the creator to prove that, yes, it was me who created it. Yes, I still retain those rights. Yes, um, it is me that owns the copyright to this. Um, and... As far as I'm aware, other countries operate similarly in terms of, well, you have the copyright the moment you create it or immediately after you create it. Um, What copyright registration does, um, at least in the United States, is grant the creator of the piece of intellectual property certain statutory benefits. Uh, It provides a searchable, largely, uh, database of works where uh, potential licensees of Uh, intellectual property can search and hopefully find someone in case they want to license them or pay them residuals or royalties. Um, And in terms of uh, if any kind of infringement occurs, having a registration, a copyright registration in place also benefits the uh, creator. Um, For example, uh, you know, if, if you don't have your copyright registered for a piece of music, yes, you can litigate it against someone who steals it, but the amount of time and resources uh, you will have to put into it will be much greater if you don't take care of registration. 
Okay, so I'm a little bit confused. So you're saying that uh, essentially in the United States as well, uh, copyright protection is automatic once it's put into material form. That's what you said, That's right? Co- that's, That's correct. So what's the whole go with the American Copyright Office where you have to go and pay money and, and formally register? Do, do, are people doing that or is that not happening on a, on a large scale? Uh, people should. Um, anyone who has any kind of valuable intellectual piece of property should register with the Copyright Office. Uh, this is this is especially pertinent for music creators. Um, if you write a song and if you have a recording of the song, you have two distinct copyrights. And if you want to protect those copyrights um, you know, as valuable IP, you should go ahead and register those. Um, Essentially, what can happen is that um, if someone decides to infringe upon your rights, you have statutory benefits that only apply to those who have registered their copyrights. So even if you do have the copyright, um, the court might say, great, you have a copyright. Uh, You know, here's your $1,000 settlement instead of, well, we have found that this company has infringed upon your rights. And we will be awarding you all the attorney's fees plus $250,000 in damages according to statutory rates. Wow. So, and and this is just one of many benefits to actually understanding the importance of copyright registration. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think there are a lot of uh, innovative opportunities that the Copyright Office of the United States uh, could be pursuing. Uh, in terms of faster registration and potentially, um, you know, more updated technology. But the way it is currently, it has to be used mm-hmm. because that is within the uh, the merit of the law. And I would advise anyone who has created a soundtrack that has sold or any 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 sort of music that has sold more than, say, a thousand copies to take care of the registration in whatever territory they are, pay, you know, the $75 or the $100 or the equivalent and just ensure that those rights are protected. Even if you're living outside the United States? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with copyright laws outside the States, so I can't really speak to those. Sure. I guess this is this gets a little bit murky, doesn't it? I don't want to go too heavy into a, a legal lecture here, but if, if, I'm, <laughs> sure. if I'm writing a song here in Australia, but then perhaps I license it to an American distributor or something, um, this is something that I might have to think about if, I'm, if I want to have that level of protection which you're talking about there, Sebastian. Uh, certainly. Wow. And as with most things, I recommend having you know an attorney or other sort of legal counsel who can walk you through the specifics. Um, with with international copyright law, it gets very tricky, mm. um, especially you know when we get to that with performance rights organization. We have ARPA AMCAS versus ASCAP in the United States, mm-hmm. uh, or BMI or two others. And in terms of the uh, the licensing and carve outs and the way that royalties are assessed, it gets very tricky very fast. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's change the conversation. Let's let's go back and talk about business skills for composers. Do you guys want to highlight for my listeners some of the major business skills that you guys believe that composers need to have, and the ones that are uh, talked about the most in your group? From my perspective, it's, it it gets really basic. In the sense that when I was young, you know, he's like, all I want to do is stand up in front of a microphone and sing. Mm -hmm. And I'll I'll let my people deal with that. (laughs) Right. You know, oh, you know, and and I think that that in today's world, because we are constantly being challenged to disseminate information. That that's that is not a good strategy to take care of yourself and be a profitable uh, a business owner to assume that, oh, I can't possibly read a business contract mm. or I can't possibly negotiate for myself. I, I can't do that. To walk into the, in today's world with that as being the mindset is you're going to have a much tougher road than if you, you assume responsibility for at least being aware of what those issues are mm. and knowing what you can and can't do. And then, uh, then subcontract what you can't accomplish. And I think this is what the, what the, 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 the group kind of focuses on and the questions we get, uh, and correct me guys, if I'm wrong, but I see this written in a, in a contract. What does this mean? Do I need to worry about this? <laughs> You know, and those those kinds of issues, or how do how do I negotiate with somebody, or or any of those myriad factors that you come in in contact with a day to day basis. You know, the more accountable that you are for all of it, 
the better off you're going to be and ultimately you're going to keep more money in your own pocket. Mm, I always say to my students, Chris, you never sign anything you don't understand. That's just crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And well, it's for the passionate musician who desperately wants an opportunity, that's easily forgotten. Mm, and especially if they, you know, a lot of them are students perhaps or uh, living quite frugally and they don't have a lot of money to go and have a lawyer look over it and do that kind of thing, which of course they should do if it's something that's, again, again they don't understand or B, it's going to stitch up their or, career for years to come. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the follow-up that, to that is is to, to succeed in any business, you have to be willing to invest in yourself. Yep, I like that. And so, so if you have to invest in a couple hours of a lawyer's time to get an expert opinion, that's an investment in your career. It's not just money out of your pocket. Mm. And uh, I say I say this respectfully, but you Americans, you, you, you sue each other sort of willy-nilly, don't you? It's just a part of business over there. It's not sort of anything personal, and it happens a lot. It's quite litigious. I'd like well, to it can be. <laughs> <laughs> it can be, depending on which news channel you watch. <laughs> See, Aaron, do you want to comment yeah. on that? Well, I'd, I just wanted to clarify that I am not American. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only American of the group. I'm sorry. But, but you're living and you're okay. and working and dealing with American that, law. That is that is true. I, you know, um, when it comes to things that um, are posted about very often in the group and that the some of the most important things that people take away from it, it's that I, I think it behooves everyone in today's um, gig economy to be a generalist mm -hmm. in in the in terms of the business skills that you have. You don't have to be an accountant, but you know you need to know how to talk to one. You yeah. don't have to be a lawyer, but you need to know what it is that you want. Mm -hmm. Right, and you need to be able to communicate with them. I mean, it's the same for any kind of business owner, because if you own a business, you are responsible for every part of it. Yeah. Uh, even even if you eventually subcontract someone to take care of that part, you are still ultimately responsible for it because the buck stops at you. Yeah. Right. There's no one else to blame after that. So um, the group is really good for people to kind of pick up these general skills and start to have a little bit of an awareness of what things in contracts uh, mean, right? And uh, what certain terms like mechanical rights, you know, versus uh, synchronization rights, you know, or what the difference between those terms. People are starting to think about that more where previously, uh, as Chris said, you know, you get a guy who stands in front of a mic and doesn't want to do any of the other stuff because, you know, in the... I guess in the old days, that's how it worked. But not everyone is going to be fortunate yeah. enough to have to be managed, to have an agent. I do not think I will ever have an agent in my life, probably because I, uh, I would be too much of a pain in the ass to work with because I <laughs> already know some, something about business, right? Yeah. So I think it's, it's this whole idea of being, uh, being able to, to have a broad base of knowledge, yeah. you know, and, and then eventually you know where to turn. Exactly. Right. Yeah. When you have a problem. I, Sorry, I Sebastian. think we're kind of, no, um, Sebastian, you have something to say? I was just no, going to say, when we're dancing around here, and I'll make this really brief, is <laughs> the shift from the bulk of my life, I was a high-paid cog in somebody else's wheel. Mm -hmm. And that was because the business model of the 20th century supported that. Yep. We are now living in an in entrepreneurial do-it-yourself kind of world, which requires that people who are in this economy have to absorb and accept and become facile in a, a much different skill set to be able to succeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, piggybacking off of uh, what uh, Xiaowan said as well, um, you know, I, I'm a business owner. I run my own business. I do the accounting, the taxes, the, uh, you know, copyright, the tech, the social media, everything, because I have to. Um, I don't enjoy most of it, but it needs to get done, right? But I surround myself with experts. Like, I, I know a little bit about everything, but I have a very good legal counsel, I have a very good accountant, and I have very good people who can advise me on social media in the hopes that, you know, what the services that I can provide to my artists and my composers uh, is that those are not things that they will have to worry about because I fulfill the expert role in their lives. Um, you know, as Chris was saying, you know, it's now a we have to be generalists to survive because we can no longer be specifically, you know, a very small 
uh, niche. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we have to do a little bit of everything. For mm. example, in in games, yes, you can be a composer, but you might also need to understand sound design and implementation and middleware and you know narrative story arcs and so on. So. Yep. Being an expert generalist is generally what I try to advise people to be. Yeah. And I love what you said, Chris, the gig economy, because that's what we're that's yes. where we're at and that's where we're moving more and more yes. towards, aren't we? Um, gentlemen, with your skills and knowledge and your involvement in business skills for composers, where are you seeing the opportunities for composers and people that are writing songs and writing music and soundtracks and soundscapes? Where are some of those coming from? Sebastian. <laughs> Cricket. <laughs> um, Don't answer that, one. There, there is a uh, I'll, I'll answer it. there there are a lot of opportunities that are in very unexpected places mm -hmm. right for example i mean uh when it comes to um sound design for example uh you you don't just you're not just making sounds for no reason Right. Sometimes, uh, for example, you have a job making uh, user interface sounds for uh, an application, like an app on your phone. Mm -hmm. And what you want to do is to increase the engagement of a user, perhaps reward them for behavior that you'd like them to repeat so that it simulates their pleasure receptors after they've been taught that a reward is to be expected when they accomplish a certain task. And if, you, if you're able to identify that, then you're, the level of thought that you put into design is it's it's much higher right and it's much more valuable to a client but the opportunities very rarely lie uh in doing one thing only right designing uh effective sound involves being able to understand someone else's business uh it, it um maybe you know writing a good um uh, creating an audio brand for a company, right, involves being able to understand their philosophies, right, the territories they're in, the kind of customers that they're trying to attract, right? And this, it's, the opportunities are there. There are a lot of opportunities, but there are not a lot of opportunities for people who just want to sit at home and write music all day, mm -hmm. right? Because the tools are getting more advanced and cheaper, and we are now kind of, uh, and I hope Sebastian is going to pick up on this because he's, he knows a lot more about this than I do. I think we're in a, in a time where we're kind of going to a volume business. There are production music libraries out there. There's so much content on Spotify. You know, there are millions of videos on YouTube. Uh, people are licensing music for cheaper and cheaper, and there is so much out there, right? So there are some opportunities in this area, but if you're, your job's going to get taken away, right? If you were just relying on producing music for videos on YouTube, right? Now everyone's going to license something from Audio Jungle for $50, right? And then what are you going to do? Mm. Those, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Sebastian, did you want to respond to that? or? Oh, it's hard to follow follow that up. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's fantastic. One, one of the things I... I'm on the lookout for is the how intellect uh, not intellectual um, AI artificial intelligence will invade the composing space. Wow! Yeah, cool. So I think in five years, more than half of all music you hear will be composed by a machine. That's crazy, isn't it? That's crazy. So um, if you know, either you become the one who writes the algorithms or you become the one that provides music to such a high enough degree uh, where, you know, AI hasn't caught up to yet. Who, so Who will own the copyright in those com uh, compositions, Sebastian? Will it be the person who created the algorithm? And a strange twist of fate, it will be the monkey who took a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that the, that the robot will own the copyright? <laughs> um well, that is for the courts in 10 years to decide yeah, when wow. everyone has sued each other and everyone is out of money. It'll yeah. be great. Interesting you know, times I mean, ahead. I, a way to kind of, kind of, kind of encapsulate to all of this is conversation is, is that there's a, been a myth that, that, that uh, skills are enough, mm -hmm. right? If I'm the, the, the most badass shredding guitar player, that's enough. Mm -hmm. If I can play anything that's put in front of me, that's enough. 
right? And I just don't believe that to be true moving forward because education is, has enabled and lower cost tools has enabled more people to enter into this business. Mm. So I think to be competitive in the face of AI, in the face of business skills or, or whatever, it is going to require you, all of us to look at what is the value proposition that we're actually offering our client and what can we offer them to make that a free exchange of goods and services to make each part of the equation happy. So it's not just a skills base and maybe it's just because of my age because I'm, I'm you know, significantly older than the other guys here and have lived a life and I'm not in the day to day hunt for jobs, but is this becomes a spiritual pursuit at a certain point about how do I improve it, uh, as a person to be able to handle all of these different challenges that, that come my way. I'm, I, I, there's a, there was a great interview with a story about a composition teacher who lived in Paris in the 20th century named Nadia Bollinger. And when asked her two, who were two best students, where it was Aaron Copeland and Quincy Jones. And Quincy was, was interviewed for this article. And she said, he said that she would always admonish him, because he was a young guy, he was in his early 20s. And she said, Quincy, your music can be no better than you are as a human being. So as, you know, as we move towards artificial intelligence and, and this changing definition of humanism, you know, might it not be a good idea to understand where you sit in that continuum and not necessarily expect that that just because you're human, that's the way life is going to be forever. Yeah. And then how do you, and then how do you differentiate yourself between all the other human beings vying for that same job? What is that value that you're offering to them? That's going to make somebody pick you. To, to piggyback, piggyback off that and Sebastian's comment about AI, right? I mean, at the risk of oversimplifying and um, assuming that we are forever going to live with capitalism, capitalism as our default operating system, um, if AI takes your jobs, right, do what AI can't do. Um, exactly. Who, yeah, right. Experts in uh, AI predict that the jobs that are going to increase in, in importance are the jobs that require humanity, right? Yeah. Nurses, caregivers, right? People for whom empathy is a part of the job description that's very important, and uh, so if you are just, if you are kind of in a production mode, do everything as fast and high quality as possible, you, 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 you know, you're not going to last long. If you're going to secure your future for at least another 20 years until they create robots that can basically <laughs> just be us, but better versions of ourselves, right? Um, in the meantime, are- in the meantime, what... Yeah. In the meantime, what you can do is uh, take the skills that you have, right? Because those are still valuable. Take the the music skills that you have, the composing skills that you have. And earlier, what I said, you know, being able to understand someone's business, being able to apply that to that particular situation and empathize with the person who's hiring you so that they feel like they are getting the solution that they need. That's important. And that's what's going to save people who still want to write music for a living, is being able to do that. I mean, even let's not even talk about the future, right? In the last 50 years, that's also been important. It's always been important. It's just that it's obviously important now because we're beginning to realize how much can actually be replaced by automation. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy, it's a, a fearful yet exciting time to be alive, I feel. It's just the, the future is... is it's exciting. It's a bit scary, and uh, we can't stop it. Here it comes, and uh, yeah, it's going to be great to see where we end up. Um, look, guys, I really enjoyed talking with you guys today. You're obviously all really highly intelligent. You all know your shit, which is fantastic. And um, I really want to thank you for your time today. I know it's uh, it's late over in uh, where you guys are today, so uh, thank you so much, Sebastian, and thank you, Sierra and Chris. Sorry, it's never it's, it's it's never late in a studio. It's always the same time. <laughs> so don't worry <laughs> about it. 
But listen, I, I really, again, do appreciate your time. And for anyone listening to my podcast today, um, Business Skills for Composers, get onto Facebook, search these gentlemen out and uh, join the group. Uh, what have you got to lose except everything to gain with this gentleman's uh, um, insights and experiences? So, uh, yeah, look, thanks again for joining me, guys. Would you like to uh, some, wrap it up with any there, last comments? There are some oh. dirty jokes in the group, so brace yourself. <laughs> No, no, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure and uh, uh, glad to be able to be of service. Excellent. All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. Well, there you go, people. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you liked it, please let me know. Come over to facebook.com forward slash music business facts. And uh, if you do head over to business skills for composers, which I again recommend that you do, tell them Rodney sent you. All right, so before I wrap up today, again, I'd like to invite uh, anyone who hasn't already joined to uh, come and check out my free video interrogation with renowned music entrepreneur Andy Farrow. Andy's probably one of the most successful guys I know in the music industry. He's an extremely accomplished artist manager, as well as having multiple music business stre- uh, income streams. Such in, He's got his hand in everything. He's got ventures in publishing and record labels and event management and festivals and merchandise and just about every uh, income stream you can think about in the music industry. Uh, so if you go to musicbusinesslecture.com, uh, that's musicbusinesslecture.com, you can check out my video interrogation with Andy Farrow. And again, it's, uh, it's a really really interesting lecture. It goes for about an hour and I encourage you to do that. I've also started my own um, Facebook group and I've called it the Music Industry Entrepreneurs Association. So I'm really trying to build, you know, extend the conversation beyond the podcast and invite everybody to come over free and uh, meet and network with other people that are interested in making money in the music industry. And uh, there's some cool discussions going over there as well. So you can either search for it on Facebook or I've connected it to a URL. You can go to www.miea.biz. That's miea.biz. Come over and check out the conversation on the Music Industry Entrepreneurs Association. Uh, As always, guys, thanks again so much for listening. I really appreciate your support. And uh, again, I hope you got something out of today's episode. Uh, If you haven't subscribed to my show, please feel free to to do that in either iTunes or Stitcher Radio, and that way you'll never miss out on an episode. And uh, till next time, I'd like to finish with a quote, and this one's from Johann Sebastian Bach, who said, I was obliged to be industrious. Whoever is equally industrious will succeed equally well. Until next time, guys, this is Rodney Holder signing off for musicbusinessfacts.com. Take care and uh, get those businesses happening, guys. All the best. You've been listening to the Music Business Facts Podcast. For more essential music business tips and information, visit musicbusinessfacts.com. 